Welcome to a special edition of the Post Call Podcast by MD Edge. I am the voice of MD Edge Podcasts and the host of this show, Nick Andrews. It's Suicide Prevention Month. It's Suicide Prevention Week. And earlier this week was Suicide Prevention Day. At MD Edge, we are aware of the ongoing suicide increase. We are committed to providing a place for physicians to talk and commiserate about their lives. And we talk about burnout and we talk about different parts of being a healthcare worker a physician, a student, a mentor, Uh, but the physician suicide situation in the United States has gotten very sobering and very intense. So in order to participate in that conversation, today we have a lecture that was published on one of our sister shows, the Sitecast by MD Edge, uh, in the spring of 2019. It is a masterclass lecture by Dr. Sidney Zizek, and it's about physician suicide. Part of publishing this lecture is participating in the conversation surrounding suicide prevention and, and surrounding physician suicide, but also to provide a resource to anyone who wants to learn more about what's going on. Um, it's very important. It's a fabulous lecture by a, a fabulous academic and, and fabulous clinician. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it and I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, no intro music this week, or excuse me, no intro music for this episode because it's a very sobering and very important topic. So we're just going to get right into it. Uh, coming up now, this is Dr. Sidney Zisuk. If you would like to learn more, there are uh, very robust academic show notes authored by uh, one of our authors, Dr. Jacqueline Posada. There are links and outlines to everything that Dr. Zisuk talks about. So I highly recommend checking it out. And uh, there, you can find anything you want in the notes as well. So let's just get right to it. This is Dr. Sidney Zisuk in the MD Edge Post Call Podcast. Uh, I'm uh, Sid Zisuk a uh, psychiatrist, um, professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego, and also the director of the Healer Education Assessment and Referral Program, otherwise known as HEAR. I'm going to be talking about physician suicide, a topic that unfortunately uh, is um, uh, sometimes considered an occupational risk so because it is so prevalent amongst physicians and for that matter other healthcare workers as well uh, who have high rates of suicide especially uh, compared to uh, other people of equal education and and gender matched. Uh, The problem of physician suicide is not new, it's been here for a long time but we're finally beginning to talk about it and uh, and I think that's the first step towards being able to do something about it. Uh, In in the past uh, physician uh, distress, physician depression, physician suicide have been shrouded in in clouds of silence uh, and um, uh, as such uh, there just have been uh, no uh, attempts at prevention uh, or or really few attempts to deal with the well-being of physicians in general. Physician suicide, um, uh, like suicide in in the general population, suicide in the general population is, uh, I believe, the only one of the top ten causes of death in the United States that's on the upswing. Uh, The others, treatments are being developed and and, uh, rates of death by other causes of death are going down. Suicide's going up. Uh, There's been about a 30 percent increase in suicide rates in the United States over the past decade and physicians are not immune. Uh, We don't know if rates are going up amongst physicians because there's not really a a terrific database on physician suicide, but they don't appear to be going down at all and more likely than not they're keeping pace with the general population. Suicide is the leading cause of death amongst male uh, residents, second leading cause of death amongst female residents, uh, and uh, it doesn't simply go away after residency is over but remains a huge problem for physicians in practice. Uh, In fact, um, uh, I, at one point in my life, lost a personal physician to suicide, and I know I'm not alone in that. Uh, The the numbers that are given, the best estimates of physician suicide, are that there are about 400 or so suicides in a year. If you think about it, that's more than one a day, Uh, Also, that's the equivalent of three or four graduating medical school classes. Uh, That's a huge, tragic, and needless loss. Uh, If you think about all of the people that are affected by physician suicide, particularly the thousands of patients each year uh, who are losing their physician, uh, the the magnitude of the loss is tremendous. 
so what can we do about it and why is there that that kind of rate and and the answer about the why is we simply don't know um, uh, we can take our best guesses and um, one of the best guesses would include uh, just looking at the kinds of people who go into medicine uh, they tend to be a very conscientious group of people who go into medicine because they care about uh, patient care and want to deliver really excellent patient care. Uh, people going into medical school and doing well enough in uh, terms of grades in, in high school and college um, uh, are people who are prone to put off immediate gratification uh, in, in search of um, uh, being able to meet the highest standards possible and get into medical schools in the first place. And, and then in medical school, it's people who are still willing to give up immediate gratification who want to get into the best residencies possible. So the competition is immense, and the kind of person who succeeds in that competition tends to be someone who uh, has uh, kind of compulsive traits. Um, uh, they're, they're willing to uh, focus on one thing at a time, uh, a sense of being able to master any obstacles, uh, which, which can lead to a sense of perfectionism, which can lead to a sense of inability to um, adapt to and cope with and accept times when we're imperfect. In medicine, uh, we are imperfect. Uh, we deal with really difficult malignant diseases. Death is a part of life, and in medicine, we meet people who die. We treat people who die. Uh, as a psychiatrist, I know um, uh, we treat people who ultimately die by their own hands, so die by suicide. And uh, as such, uh, we are facing what we may consider a personal failure on a fairly regular basis. And if we think of it as a personal failure, it becomes very hard to, uh, to accept. Uh, you know, rather than uh, thinking of, um, of illness, chronic illness, treatment resistant disorders, uh, and ultimately death of patients as part of life. And uh, if we do tend to feel like there's something we could or should have done differently, that we could have prevented it, that it's an imperfection in us, then, then guilt and blame uh, can become a part of our reaction. And, and guilt and blame in a vulnerable person can um, uh, if not on their, in their own, lead to suicide, but can be part and parcel of a picture. Uh, suicide itself is, uh, is not caused by any one simple factor. We do know that there are certain vulnerabilities to suicide. There are biological vulnerabilities like uh, uh, the, the serotonin uh, system uh, being uh, uh, more prone to uh, have uh, issues related to it and people who end up being suicidal. If you're unlucky enough to be born with a short allele of the serotonin transporter gene, uh, you may be more prone to depression or suicide, especially if you've also had early childhood uh, abuse uh, or mistreatment, and especially if in that context you also face stress in adulthood. And being a physician is a stressful occupation. Again, in part because of the illnesses we treat, but in part because of changes that are occurring in the healthcare system. Uh, there's been lots and lots of discussions about burnout, and um, underlying burnout are um, demands and expectations for physicians that exceed the resources to meet those demands. And uh, in, a, in a chronic situation, that can be exceedingly stressful. It can lead to burnout, burnout can lead to depression, Depression is a very common underlying condition in people who ultimately suicide. Uh, probably the two major risk factors for suicide are a past history of a suicide attempt and depression, and especially depression which is untreated or inadequately treated. And again, physicians are vulnerable here because physicians, just like other people, um, are influenced a lot by stigma about mental illness and mental illness treatment, and in fact may even be more stigmatized than the general population for fear of getting treatment for a mental illness interfering with their ability to be promoted or even to be licensed. Uh, uh, in, in reality, in most states now, and licensing applications 
the question is not whether you've been treated for an illness, but whether you're impaired by a current mental illness. Uh, but still, uh, physicians are very frightened, and, and in some states, uh, the question is, have you ever had a, a, a mental illness? Have you ever been treated? And, and that in and of itself will discourage physicians uh, from getting treatment. So you, you've got the other factors of vulnerability, like untreated depression, uh, like uh, biological vulnerabilities, uh, the stresses and strains of everyday life, and added to that are the stresses and strains that are unique to being a physician. And as I mentioned, part of that is just dealing with difficult patients. Um, uh, part of that is the healthcare system. And um, uh, one of the things that's occurring in the healthcare system now is uh, increased documentation demands and, and the electronic medical record. And when you ask physicians, what are the underlying causes of a burnout in your own practice? Electronic medical records are also very, are always very high on the list. Um, they're cumbersome, they're time consuming, they ask for documentation of all sorts of information which is not readily uh, apparently related to quality of care or patient's well being, but they take time and, and it's easy to get bogged down on them. Uh, uh, one fairly recent large survey found that physicians are actually spending more time on electronic medical records during the day than they are face to face with patients and they're even spending time at home uh, during what should be family time and relaxation time completing those same medical records. Uh, in addition, uh, anyone who's gone to a physician recently uh, probably has had the experience of their physician instead of looking into their eyes when they're working with them, looking into their computer and trying to get as much of the electronic records out of the way as they can. But that interferes with the ability to form relationships with patients, which after all is the reason most of us go into medicine in the first place, to develop and foster those kinds of ongoing relationships. Uh, the, um, uh, so the, the workload is not decreasing uh, documentation is increasing, uh, the need to keep up with um, uh, um, continuing education uh, in order to maintain licensing is uh, increasing if anything, uh, and yet no one's giving anyone the resources or the time to add these additional uh, burdens to our practice, so we're squeezed. Uh, we're squeezed by having uh, more requirements uh, more of those requirements being non-patient uh, requirements, uh, documentation and being involved in technology, uh, and, and no one gives us time to do it. Uh, we're also, in, in this modern era, um, we're tied to uh, electronic devices. Uh, it used to be when you took a vacation, you were on vacation. Now you take a vacation, your cell phone's with you, you're available to anyone who, who cares to call you, uh, patients if they have your cell phone number, colleagues at work, staff at work, uh, and not only that, uh, most of us uh, tend to try to keep up with email every day we're on vacation, and whereas um, uh, maybe a decade ago that didn't take too long, uh, currently uh, myself just to keep up with email, I'm probably talking about a couple hours a day. Um, and, and so again, we're just being squeezed in so many directions. Uh, so because of all that, um, uh, depression goes untreated, suicide rates remain high, uh, and, uh, and the good news though is people are finally paying attention. And organizations are paying attention, organizations are putting up new guidelines, there's new rules and regulations uh, for residency programs that residency training directors have to not only um, uh, prioritize their residents' uh, well-being and mental health, but also have to attend to the faculty's well-being and mental health. That's a responsibility of training directors, is to make sure the faculty also uh, is taking care of themselves because a, a burnt out faculty member um, uh, dramatically affects a resident as well. So this is a lifelong process. And uh, so, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, new rules and regulations are occurring for that, uh, but on the other hand, uh, the goal is, is a virtuous one, and that is that physicians take care of themselves and each other and provide support for themselves and each other. 
we hope that uh, with that kind of support, uh, a sense of, of wellness and well-being and quality of life and pride in being a physician can be restored. Uh, and, um, and it doesn't take uh, too much of a stretch to think that ultimately that would increase the likelihood of physicians taking care of themselves, increase the likelihood of them getting treated for depression when it's there, or anxiety disorders, or substance use disorders, et cetera, all of which um, uh, we think would dramatically reduce the rates of suicide and um, in increasing the probability of, of physicians being engaged and enthused uh, and invigorated by the work they do.